Uh, my name is Barbara Phillip. I am a pediatrician from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a member of the um, newborn medicine division at our hospital, and I work as a hospitalist on our unit. I was one of the people to lead our hospital to baby friendly. We have now been designated for 24 years. The topic I'm speaking about here is medications and human milk. Our objectives will be to learn about the relative infant dose, to talk about pharmacokinetic factors, to learn about four reliable resources to look for, for information when you're concerned about the safety of medications and human milk, and then we'll discuss some common questions that come up about various things if it's safe to breastfeed. So how to decide if a medicine is safe to breastfeed. We're gonna look at two uh, topics. One is relative infant dose, and the second is pharmacokinetic factors. So relative infant dose, it's uh, referred to as RID. This is a popular method for determining safety. Um, it provides information on relative neonatal exposure by taking into account the amount of maternal and infant exposure based on weight and the concentration of the drug that's in the breast milk. Um, basically, if the RID is less than 10 percentile, most medications are relatively safe to use. This is a slide of an example of some common medications that are used, and then you can see what the relative infant dose is. So you can see for amoxicillin, which is an antibiotic, the RID is 0.95%, so that's much less than 10th percentile, so that's safe to use based on this one determinant. Nifedipine is an antihypertensive commonly used in the postpartum wards for hypertension. You can see that the RID there is 2.3 to 3.4%, so that's also below 10%. And Ativan is an anti-anxiety, and that is the RID for that is also less than 10%. So the second thing we look at are pharmacokinetic factors, and what these are are factors that govern the drug transfer across membranes into breast milk, as well as how the drug is metabolized in both the mother and the infant. There are a bunch of pharmacokinetic factors, so let's just look at a few. We're gonna look at passive diffusion, molecular weight, protein binding, lipid solubility, half-life, and oral bioavailability. First, passive diffusion. This is an easy concept. So medications uh, get into the mother's plasma at a certain concentration, and then they will diffuse into the breast milk space, going from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, assuming that they're small enough to get into the space. And equilibrium forces drive this. As you can see by this picture, Passive diffusion can be bi-directional. So let's use the example of alcohol for this. So a mother drinks a glass of wine. Her blood level of alcohol will go up for a short period of time. During that time period, the alcohol can go from the mother's uh, plasma into the breast milk space. But as the mother metabolizes the alcohol, her blood level will go down and then the alcohol can come out. So it's bi-directional. Again, it has to be small enough in size to get in there. So that's passive diffusion. Molecular weight looks at how big the medicine is. By definition, if, if the medication's molecular weight is more than 800 Daltons, that will not get into breast milk because it's too big to get in there. Uh, I often make a joke that I don't know what a Dalton is and I don't know what it looks like, but I do know that someone does, and they have determined that if it's greater than 800 Daltons, it's not gonna get in there. You can look at charts and find out how big medications are. So you can see that heparin at, with a size of 40,000 Daltons is just never gonna get into the mother's breast milk space. The same for insulin, which is more than 6,000 Daltons, well above our 800 mark. But you can see that alcohol is small enough to get in there. So next, let's look at the pharmacokinetic factor of protein binding. This is similar to albumin in the blood, so to bilirubin in the blood attaching to albumin. So um, we know if bilirubin is bound to albumin, it's not going to get into the baby's brain and cause trouble with kernicterus. So the same thing with medications. Um, they circulate in the mother's bloodstream either bound or not bound to a protein, which is albumin, and it's very large, albumin's quite large. So because of its size, if the medication is bound to the albumin, it's not going to get into the human milk space. However, if it's not bound, it can get in there. And a definition of good protein binding that you don't have to worry is if the medication is, is bound at greater than 90%. 
So here's just some examples to see. Diazepam, the protein binding for that medication is 99%, so that's good and safe. Ibuprofen, it's greater than 99%, that's good and safe. And warfarin is 99%, so all three of those are safe based on this one pharmacokinetic factor. But if you look at lithium, you can see that it has a protein binding of zero, so you have to be careful with that one. So let's look at lipid solubility. Um, we know that human milk has great amounts of great fat. So um, medications, um, the easier a medicine dissolves in fat, the higher the medication levels will be in breast milk because there's so much fat in there. And we're interested in if drugs are active in the CNS. Um, and if a drug is active in the CNS, there will be higher levels in milk than can be expected. Um, although those amounts are usually okay. So lipid solubility is an important thing to consider. Another pharmacokinetic factor is half-life. Um, we prefer medications with a shorter half-life. Remember, five half-lives and it's basically out of the mother system. So here's some examples. Alcohol has a pretty quick half-life of 24 minutes. Keflex, 50 minutes. Ibuprofen, 120 minutes. But look at Prozac, which is an antidepressant, and you can see that that has a fairly long half-life of 216 hours. So that would be one reason to be careful for that. So the final thing to talk about about pharmacokinetic factors are, is oral bioavailability. This is the amount of medicine or drug that is absorbed from the gut and gets into the bloodstream. So remember, if a mother takes a medication by mouth, the root goes into her gut, it gets absorbed, it goes into her blood system, then if it's small enough and it's not protein bound, it will go into the maternal milk, then into the baby's gut, and then remember the baby has to absorb it as well. Now, low oral bioavailability may be due to a reduced absorption in the GI tract, poor GI stability due to acidity, or a high first pass uptake by the liver. So things can affect the oral bioavailability. Here's some examples. Genomycin is an antibiotic. It's never given by mouth because it's not absorbed orally. So you can see that oral bioavailability is less than 1%. Insulin and heparin are both destroyed in the gut, which is why they're never given by mouth, and their oral bioavailabilities are 0%. So in summary, drugs transfer into human milk if they have a higher concentration in maternal plasma than in the milk, if they're low in molecular weight, less than 800 Daltons, if they're low in protein binding, less than 90%, if they're highly lipid soluble, they love to get into that milk, and then once in the breast milk, they have to be absorbed. They often say that it, it's a good talk if you can remember one thing from a talk in a year, so I hope that you'll remember this one thing from this talk, and that are these resources that I recommend when you are looking for this question of safety in breastfeeding. The first one that I recommend, and I have no financial interest in this at all, but Hale's Medication and Mother's Milk, so you can see a copy of Mother's Milk book here. So hey, Dr. Hale is a pharmacologist from Amarillo, Texas, and he has, he has many resources for us to do, but the main one is his book. You can see a picture of it here, and he updates his book every two years. You can also get a resource for your facility so that it can be on your computer for everyone in your hospital to see. We have that at our hospital. You can also get an app on your phone that's called Infant Risk Center, or you can call the Infant Risk Center at that number. And the app on your phone, I, the last time I got it, it cost $10 and it's very much worth it. So what Tom Hale does is that he in his book takes a medication and he puts every medication into one of five categories. So they're called lactation risk categories, LRC, but people refer to it in short as like L1 or L2. So briefly, the five categories are L1 and L2 for me, they're compatible. I don't spend much time on it because that means to me that Dr. Hale believes these are safe. I can read about it if they want, but if they're L1 or L2, I move on and say A-OK -okay for mom. If it's L3, it can be one of two things. It can truly be an L3 on that scale, or L3 can mean that there's really no data on the medication, and so it's put into L3 because he's not sure, so then I take the time to read about it in his discussion about the medication, and I possibly will go to other resources for that drug. 
L4 means you've got to be a little bit careful. I will often copy the page and go in and talk with the mom about it. Um, I believe there are some definite risks with using infant formula compared to breastfeeding. So I like to have a discussion with the mom so she can feel fully educated and make an informed choice. And then L5 on the scale is hazardous and that is a medication or drug that's contraindicated in women who are breastfeeding. So that's the first resource is HALE. The second resource is LACMED. That's a website that you can access via the internet, obviously. And you just type in LACMED. This is a database, database put out by the National Institute of Health. And um, it's great. They don't, it, LACMED doesn't rank it into categories, but you can still go in and read. And this is an example of a page from the LACMED um, website. And you just type the medicine in, and then it gives you information. And you can see they have a little summary box saying um, use, and use for lactation. You can read about it there. The third resource to use, so we've got HALE. We've got LACMED. We have Electancia. This is for Spanish-speaking folks, and um, it's um, well used and well liked. And I just want you to know about this one. This is not one that I use because I'm, my Spanish is not that good, but for people who are Spanish-speaking, I would recommend this one. And then the final one is the Trash the Pump and Dump website. This is put out by Anna Glash, who's the founder of IABLE which is the Institute for the Advancement of Breastfeeding and Lactation Education. You just type in trashthepumpanddump.org. Mm -hmm.